Hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, How Accountants Can Make Financial Planning Work in the Future of Financial Advice. If you've not met me before, my name is Michael Carter, often known as MC. I'm the founder of Practice Paradox and our focus is helping accounting and advisory firms build marketing machines. But it's my pleasure today to introduce to you in a moment Sue Viskovich. Sue founded Elixir Consulting in 2006 and Elixir Consulting has been living in a, in a parallel universe to ours in that Sue and her team of coaches who are dotted around Australia work with financial planning firms primarily and they help them build basically great businesses that deliver good quality advice but still deliver a good lifestyle for everyone involved, the owners and the team members within those businesses. And um, we, I met Sue uh, earlier this year at a conference that accountants and financial planners were at and we're really coming from the same place in terms of our values. And the opportunity that we see for really good quality advice to be de delivered in a way that, yes, it's profitable, but there's more to life than making money. You've got to tick that box. You also, there's an opportunity to really impact upon people's lives. So before I introduce Sue, I'll just give you a couple of tips. After today's session, you can go to a LinkedIn group. We'll paste in later the link to it, but there's the short link on screen now. bit.ly forward slash paradox live. That'll redirect to a LinkedIn group that you can join so the conversation doesn't have to stop at the end of today. One other thing, you can ask questions throughout today's webinar. I'll be keeping an eye on those questions and Sue can roll with the punches. She's given me permission to um, interrupt if you like and chime in as you ask your questions that will appear on the screen. So don't hold back. You can expand your go-to panel on the side of your screen. You'll see a little questions area. Type in questions as they come to you. Any questions that we don't get to during today's session, we will then address on the LinkedIn group. So do be sure to join that group later on. So I'll ask my webinar co-pilot to make Sue the presenter. So we see Sue's slide deck. And in a moment, we'll see Sue herself. Hi, Sue. How are you? Hi. Very well, thanks, MC. How are you? Fantastic. We've been looking forward to this now um, for over a month. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to you. And I'll be taking notes myself in that you know, you're one of probably two or three people in Australia that I know that have such a depth of experience and expertise in this area. So over to you, Sue. Lovely. Thanks, MC. And uh, no pressure there. Hopefully I live up to that great rap. Well, hi, everybody. And thanks for joining us today. I, too, have been looking forward to, to uh, sharing some knowledge with you. Uh, just to, to give a little bit more visibility to what MC was talking about, my team of coaches are on the screen there now in front of you. We do look after businesses all around Australia and I've just popped up there. We actually have two facets to our business. One is Elixir Consulting where we provide primarily business coaching for financial advisors uh, and a lot of our clients are actually planning businesses that sit within accounting businesses. We also have a business called, or I guess a brand called Pricing Advice. So I've actually just released my revised edition of my book called Pricing Advice because we work with a lot of planners to, and we have done for many years, to help them actually create a fee model for their business. So both our websites are on screen there if you want to, uh, to bookmark those. And if anybody does use Twitter, well, you can follow us on Twitter as well. Our handle is Elixir Coaches down in the corner there. So. I'd like to, now that you know a little bit about us, I'd like to hear a little bit about you and uh, if I can get a feel for who we have on the, on the line today. The first question I have before we activate our quiz is can you raise your hand for me if you are a financial advisor and not an accountant? Great if you work within an accounting practice but all of those who are financial advisors, can you raise your hand for me so I can see how many we have in the room? Excuse me while I look away from the camera here just to see who we've got. And so for those who've come in late, um, you might be physically raising your hand. Just look for the little uh, raise hand button and give that a click and that'll give us an idea of who's in the room. Good point. <laughs> You're not making, casting any aspersions over financial advisors, are you there, MC? I wouldn't dream of it. <laughs> okay, good. So we do have a couple on the line, but a large majority, I think. I think we've got about five of the whole group. So that's great. Hi, welcome, guys. Hopefully you'll get some great tips to how to... Uh, to uh, uh, advance your business. But for the rest of you, um, we're just going to pop up a poll on screen now. So we'll get you to actually do a little bit of work. 
and uh, if you can share with us the answer to this question. So there we go. So how do you currently service your client's financial planning needs? So either you don't um, and go right ahead and start making your votes there, that's great, people are dropping in. So either you don't currently, you've got the same staff members that provide accounting and financial planning advice, some of you might have planners within your organisation, you either refer to a, an external planner and you don't generate revenue from that or you refer to an external planner and you do actually share income with them based on the, the work that you refer to them. So that's good, we're getting uh, a lot of you voting now, that's excellent. A few left to vote. We'll keep it going okay. Sue until 80% have voted. So if you're sitting just looking at the screen guys and you haven't clicked the mouse, do it. We're at 73%, just a few more votes and then we'll close that off. One more right. of you vote and we are there. Okay, we'll close that Thank off now everyone. and we'll share those results. Okay, what have we got there? So you're sharing that on screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll talk you through that. We've got 20% have answered we don't service clients' financial planning needs. 7% answered that they have the same staff members providing accounting and financial planning. And 42%, so the vast majority, highest response was we have financial planners within our firm. 18% refer to an external planner and don't share the income. And 13% refer to an external planner and share the income. So 20% don't, 7% have the same staff doing it, 42% have an in-house financial planner, 18% refer on and don't share income and 13% refer to an external planner and have a relationship where they share the income. Great, okay, thank you for that MC and thanks everyone for participating in that. Um, so a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, I have an awful lot of information to share with you um, and as MC said, I really do welcome anybody asking questions as we go along, that would be great. Um, let's first of all have a look at uh, a bit of a case study. So I've got a couple of, uh, of just very simple uh, graphs that I'm going to share with you. The first of one here is a business that came to have a chat to us in late 2012 about helping them out and this was an accounting practice who had financial planning within the business and they gave us their numbers for the financial planning business and you can see here uh, when they started tracking their income they were sitting on about 120,000 a year back in 2005, they sort of had a very slow growth for a number of years there, hit their strides in 2007 which was very interesting considering what was happening in the markets at that time but then they really plateaued out at about 2009 and they really got to a point, I mean they, they managed to grow the revenue to just over $250,000 in quite a significant about seven years um, uh, time which is not a great level of growth. But it was a similar story that I tend to hear from a lot of accounting practices that they did start financial planning because it made sense to them, uh, that they knew that they wanted to take care of their clients but they just were not making it work as well as they would have liked. Um, so let me just show you the difference that it makes for the business that gets it right and I'll try not to scroll through my slides too quickly there. Here's a bit of a better story. This is actually a business that we've worked with for a number of years. These guys are one of our coaching clients. In the first few years, I think they brought us in around the beginning of 2007. So you can see they actually started from the same starting point as the previous business. They were generating about just over 150,000 before they started tracking these numbers. And they had a fairly steady growth up until 2008. They dropped a little bit. They had a, a loss of a staff member. But over this time, the first year or two was actually a single financial advisor. And then they brought in an additional guy around 2000, late 2007. And the long story short, um, they've almost hit 1.2 mil uh, in the last financial year. And this next year already, they're on track to be hitting about 1.4 million turnover. Uh, and a good healthy profit margin too, they'll probably be sitting on about 35% profit margin this year. So some of the things I'm going to share with you today are some of the things that we've seen in practice with this particular business that we've helped them implement and indeed all of the ideas I'm bringing to you are a collaboration of the knowledge that I have from our whole team around Australia. As I say, we do work with a lot of accounting practices across our, our whole group and we do get together quite, uh, quite frequently as a team to share knowledge and ideas. So. 
I thought the first place, as with, with everything, a really good place to start here is why would you really concentrate on, on giving advice to your clients outside of pure accounting advice? And I guess there's a number of, of reasons behind here. Firstly, if we look from the client's perspective, the bottom line is many people need really good quality financial advice over and above the taxation advice and perhaps the business advice that you might be giving them now as an accountant. And they need a really good trusted source of advice. And most people, you only need to look at all the statistics, most people do find that one of their people in the highest, uh, their list, highest up on their list of people that they trust is their accountant. Um, you do have a, a very privileged position in that regard. So it just makes sense that they would look to you uh, to support them. Uh, and, and if you can provide them with really good quality financial advice that uh, in addition to their accounting advice, um, that would just be a great outcome for them. And in actual fact, most people don't differentiate the way those of us in the business do. So the, the average uh, puncher, I guess, if you like, considers financial advice as being anything to do with money. So at the moment, if they don't have an advisor, they come to you to take care of their tax needs, and they just bundle all of that in the same in the same bucket. Uh, so they would necessarily, or they would um, uh, quite easily expect and thank you for providing advice in house, or at least being a conduit to getting them really good quality financial advice. If we look from a business perspective or perhaps a more selfish perspective, it's a great way to really protect your client relationships because if you're not introducing them to a great financial advisor, be it in-house or external, and I'm going to talk about those options, but if you're not, someone else is going to. Uh, so it is a great way to make sure that you do maintain that relationship with your clients as well so that they don't go and seek advice elsewhere. And we do, are seeing already uh, a lot of financial advisors, there tends to be a trend happening in the moment where a lot of financial advisors are actually buying accounting businesses and bolting that on to their financial planning business. So more and more of them, if they have the, um, the contact with the client to provide financial advice, they're going to start offering them accounting advice as well. So it's a bit of a, a business threat that you can mitigate. The other side is from a, a pure business relationship perspective and, a, and an enjoyment factor of working with clients, it really does deepen the relationship that you have with your clients. You, you, you take your conversations beyond purely financial uh, and purely tax and you take them far more into, uh, I guess, lifestyle decisions and what really motivates them and drives them as people. Um, and then you can help create their, their financial plan around that. It also then helps you do some more strategic thinking, gives you um, a lot of the guys that we speak to who have moved out of accounting and into financial planning so that they're finding that they're actually getting the ability to do a lot more strategic thinking and do a lot more things with their clients than just when they were servicing them from an accounting perspective. And it is a great opportunity to generate significantly higher profits than we would tend to see um, in a typical accounting practice. And I, and I do apologise if I offend anybody there. Uh, when I say typical accounting practice, I say if we're comparing it to an accounting practice that's using hourly rates to charge their clients. And the other thing to think about too is the value of your business. And this is probably the reason why we're seeing more and more financial planning businesses by accounting practices is because the valuations of a planning business is significantly higher than that in, uh, of an accounting practice. Now, I, I think we're probably going to see in the future, we're not going to be see replication of the, the highs of four, five times recurring income that have happened in the past, but certainly we're still seeing valuation uh, of financial planning practices still sitting up around the two and a half to three times recurring revenue. And if you compare that to depends who quotes it, 0.7 to 1 times what you would get for fees on an accounting practice, it makes great business sense to be doing it if you're going to build that asset. At the same time though, it can be a distraction from your core business. So there's a lot of things that you do want to take into account when you're thinking about how you're going to service these needs of your clients. It doesn't mean you can get those first few things like protecting the client relationship, making sure that you um, uh, support them in that trusted relationship by helping them get advice, that doesn't mean that you have to do it in-house. There's quite a few different options and we're going to touch on those today. So, we all know that the rules are changing. So, by 30th of June 2016, 
the uh, um, exemption that you're acting under at the moment is going to go. Now, I, we did make a, a real point um, in the lead up to this, this session that this was not a compliance uh, webinar. So I'm not going to be going into lots of details about the ASIC rules. I think you're probably well aware of them already. Um, but in a nutshell, by 30th of June 2016, you're no longer going to be able to uh, advise on the establishment of a self-managed super fund unless you have at least an accountant's limited license. So what are your options? Well, I've got them on screen. First option is just stop giving advice on self-managed super funds, um, and that's probably not really a viable option, so that's about all I'm going to say about that for most people. The second option is to refer your clients to a licensed financial advisor to discuss anything to do with the self-managed super fund or, or their greater financial planning needs, and that could be um, in-house or external. The third is you can get uh, a limited AFS license, which means that you can then continue to talk to your clients about self-managed super funds. And depending on the different things that you're going to talk to them about, you can get a limited scope license to be um, sector specific to the types of things that you're talking about. Now you've got two options on how to do that. You can either go directly to ASIC and apply for a, a limited license yourself, or you can go through a licensee. And I'll talk to you about both of those options. The fourth option is that you get a full AFS license directly, so you become self-licensed uh, and you don't have the accountant's limited license that does open you up to be able to provide a, a broader range of services. And of course the fifth option is that you also get that full license but you go in through a, another licensee um, and you become an authorised rep or perhaps your business becomes a cor corporate authorised rep to be able to do that. So as I say, I'm not really going to talk more about option one because I don't think that's really going to be big on too many people's agenda. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each of these areas. And by all means, if you do have any queries, um, just either raise your hand or pop them in the question box there and MC is going to interrupt any time he likes because I'm going to focus on what I'm talking about and not look at the questions list. So um, I'm assuming most of you, if you do currently advise on self-managed super funds, you're going to want to continue to do that. And if I have covered this too briefly for you, uh, I know you're probably all over this, but you know, if you're a member of the CPA or the Institute or the IPAs, they've got some really good support services around a little bit more detail on the compliance aspect of this. So I'd like to talk about the more of the business aspects. So first of all, let's look at option two. If you're going to start referring out to an external party, so again, number of options you can do here. You can find an advisor and start effectively doing mutual referrals. So you refer your clients to them for financial planning, they refer their clients to you for their accounting needs, you don't share any income. Now there's a lot of uh, techniques and tips and tricks that you can do in these sorts of relationships to make them work and I am going to cover them in the next few slides. The second option that you have is that you can have an external party, you can refer your clients to them and you can have a share in the upfront income or the initial income that they generate from the clients. Now as you know, financial planners can't take commissions for uh, investment advice anymore uh, and by and large most advisors do tend to charge an initial fee for the work that they do because there does tend to be a big spike in the amount of work that you do for a new client coming on board. So. Yes, it's a generalisation, but the large majority of advisors will charge an initial fee for the initial piece of work and then an ongoing fee for their ongoing services. And so I've seen a lot of relationships where the accountant will receive a split of the initial fee that the advisor generates, but they don't get any of the ongoing income. And look, there's a, there's a good argument for that. I mean, the, the financial advisor would say, well, it's up to me if I get to keep that client because if I don't service them well, they're not going to stick with me. Um, absolutely, I'm happy to pay the accountant for that referral because it's, a, I guess, a marketing expense that I don't have to incur. But once I bring that client on board, it's, it's all my work in, in keeping them and making sure that they're happy and they stick with me for the longer term. And a lot of accountants are quite happy with that. Um, obviously, with the first option, you're still going to want to ensure that the planner you're referring to is a great quality planner and that it's a good representation of your brand and your relationship if you've referred clients to them, but you don't want to get involved in any of the financial aspects of it, and that's absolutely fine. We see a great deal of relationships on that basis. Second option is sharing upfront income. The third option is that you share in the entire income. So this is probably the least common um, uh, option that I see, um, but there are certainly some relationships where the financial planner will pay a split or a percentage of the ongoing income as well as the initial income to the accountant. 
Um, there are a few things that we'll, we'll look at in terms of determining whether you really want to take that route. Um, the next option is a joint venture. So this is where, again, it's still an external uh, financial advisor, but you effectively create um, a new entity that you both own shares in, and it could be 50-50 or 80-20, whatever you like, uh, but basically the clients are owned in that entity and you share both income and the asset value. So if you do end up selling that client book uh, or that, that, that group of clients later on, then you're actually generating an income from the asset of that business as well. I've seen this work quite well when it's part of a succession strategy. So um, on more than one occasion, I've seen where an accountant and financial advisor have had a relationship. Uh, they set it up in a proper joint venture. Uh, the uh, financial advisor decides that they're going to retire at some point down the track. Um, it, when it starts, the accountant doesn't have the level of business to warrant employing someone full time. They work it on that basis over a number of years. And then when it does come time for the financial advisor to retire, the business is of a significant size that can warrant employing a planner in-house and the accountant buys out the exiting financial planner. That can be quite an effective strategy. And usually in terms of the income, uh, again, you guys are, are probably all over this, but often we, we tend to see that the business is set up as a business, the financial planner is paid a, a, a salary commensurate with the work that they would do, and then the profit share is split after the overheads are, are, are paid out of that. So, lots of different options there to select from. And uh, the next question is, how do you actually make these things work? Because again, as, as I say, uh, I know there's a lot of businesses, and in fact, Gosh, uh, over the last few years, I've probably talked to 100 or more who have been in the situation where they have put together some sort of relationship and it just hasn't got the results that they were looking for. So a couple of things to be aware of. Everybody knows about the acronym WIFM. Well, here's WIFT. What's in it for them? So I would really be looking at what is the motivation for the advisor to enter into this relationship with you? Now you might think that's a really silly question. You might think that you think, well, of course, Sue, it's because that they want to get new clients and uh, they see it as a great relationship, they get really warm leads. Well, in actual fact, if you look at it from the perspective of, of a financial advisor, if they also have uh, other sources of generating uh, new clients and if they're going to be splitting the revenue of your referrals with you, imagine a situation where they have one appointment left in the diary they have one inquiry coming in that's referred by you. They have one inquiry coming in from their other marketing uh, exercises because they've subscribed to MC and they're very good at that. Uh, they're going to have to split the revenue with you. They're going to keep all the revenue from this client. Where do you think their priorities are going to lie? Look, that's a very simple example, but it's really important that you do understand what's the motivation for the advisor to do it and, and how is that going to play out on the long term. Often we find, and we, we work with a lot of advisors on this as well, and say, look, don't get too caught up in the fact that you really need new clients right now. As all of the uh, um, uh, activities that you're doing start to come out off, you will get to a time where you're not quite as um, desperate, it's probably too strong a word, but quite as needy to get all of those referrals. So really consider whether this is a long-term strategy that will work. Remuneration, and I'm just giving away the next one, trust. Remuneration is really important. Do make sure that you're very clear on how you're going to split the income, if you're going to split the income, or if you're going to do it on a, on a um, just a, a mutual referral relationship. Trust is paramount. I think you all know that. Again, this is a bit of a no-brainer. But it's really important that you not only trust that the client is going to be looked after, that the advisor really is one that takes their puts their clients first, uh, acts in their best interest. Yes, I know they have to by law by now, uh, but there are certainly some... There's, there's a range of different financial advisors. Uh, I, I find all of the guys that we work with, I would absolutely send my mother to them. Um, unfortunately, though, I do meet some that I probably would not. So it's really important that you use your, um, your own intuition in that regard. Um, but also that you trust their technical competence. So it's one thing to be a great guy and to be really good with clients and have a really good service ethic, but they don't, if, if they don't have the level of technical competence for the type of complexity that your clients tend to have, then they're not going to be a suitable referral partner for you. Professional respect is really important. One of the reasons that we see referral relationships not working is because the actual accountants that are meeting with clients on a day-to-day -day basis, 
don't necessarily respect the skills of the financial advisor. Now, that could be quite different to the partners. So often the partners have structured this relationship and they see the need and the importance in giving their clients access to great advice, but the people actually seeing them on a day-to-day -day basis are not doing a great deal with them. Communication is important for the ongoing relationship as well. So once you have established how you're going to work together, getting together on a very regular basis so that they can keep in touch or you can keep in touch with what's actually happening with the people that they've referred to you. So it's important if you are sending referrals that they're not actually helping the clients is to understand are you sending the right type of people? Perhaps the type of clientele that they want to work with are not the sort of people that you're sending to them. And indeed, I would suggest if you're working with a planner who is prepared to take on anybody with a heartbeat that you send, they might not be the level of quality that you're after. Uh, so make sure that you do are really clear on that and then once you have relationships starting to happen, you know exactly what they've done with each of the clients that you're working with. Hello, everybody. Hi, Sue. Um, by the way, there are a few intermittent audio issues, but we'll press on. Uh, there's a question that's come through from Julie, and it relates to what you've just touched on there, but maybe you could drill deeper. Julie asks, how do you choose a good financial planner who will work with you in terms of doing your due diligence? You mentioned a few things earlier about intuition, etc. but what are some actual due diligence activities that can be done so that you can do your homework and reduce the risk of the clients not getting a good experience? Great question. Thank you, Julie. And MC, are you sure you didn't look at my slides? Because I think that's my very next slide. Perfect timing. Uh, okay. Well, good question, Julie. Well done. Thanks, I'll sign off the webcam for now. So <laughs> oh, sorry about that. We love timing. So, how do you assess all of these different areas? So, technical competence is the first thing. Uh, firstly, you want to consider the type of clients that you have and the types of needs that they're going to have. If you deal with um, small businesses, you want to make sure that you have an advisor that is used to dealing with SMEs and the type of financial planning needs that they have. Um, you want to look at their education. Uh, have they got uh, further qualifications other than just the minimum because we know that the minimum is too low. Uh, so ideally, look, if it were me, I'd probably be looking for a certified financial planner. It is the highest level uh, of uh, designation in financial services. But also look beyond that. Have a look at the different studies that they've done and really importantly, their ongoing CPD that they do because just as um, accountants, financial planners have CPD requirements, uh, but what type of CPD are they doing? Is it just sort of fairly simple things or are they really staying up to date uh, in the different areas that you work with? A great way to do that would be to give them a couple of sample clients. If you want to remove, either sign a confidentiality agreement with them first or remove the names of the clients that you've got, but give them a couple of case studies and say, okay, here's a typical client of mine, what would you do with somebody like this? Now, depending on the advisor, they might just sit down and give you a, a straight off the top of your head, they could jump at it and give you a high level view of the types of strategies that you might implement. Or they might say, look, can I take this away, leave it with me, I want to do some financial modelling and I'll come back and present the strategies that I would be talking to and then they would actually be able to give you some um, financial outcomes that they might generate from that advice. Uh, but there are ways that you can suggest. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going, you're going to know all of the skills that they have and that you're going to be an expert so you can test them against the knowledge that they have. But you'll know pretty quickly if they're, if they're fudging things and glossing over the, the actual knowledge. The other area here is areas of specialty. So um, there are some financial advisors who are what we would call a GP. So they cover pretty much anything. Um, but often it does mean that they are inch deep, mile wide. So they know enough to get by with your typical uh, sort of mum and dad client. Uh, but if it does come into a really complex client, they might not have the depth of knowledge in a particular area. So I've just listed a couple of different areas there. Insurance is one that um, there are two options. Some advisors uh, do, or many advisors do insurance and uh, investment advice. Uh, and there are others that are purely specialist insurance advisors only. Now, if you're dealing with families and you're dealing with business owners, insurance should be 
on the top of your list about the type of quality advice that you can provide or get access to for your clients. Whether it be life insurance, income protection or key man insurance, partners insurance, these sorts of issues are so critically important in a business and uh, I've often met with many an accountant who has said to me, look, before I had a client who had an issue in their business, I never rated insurance. I thought it was just a dodgy salespeople and it was something my client didn't need. And then I had a client who actually had an issue in their business they needed to claim and I saw the difference it made in their lives. So if you're not already recognising the need for people to get really good quality insurance advice, I would suggest you, um, you perhaps think twice about it. Um, an option for insurance is, is having, you may even have one financial advisor who does pure risk advice and they're going to be very technically proficient in it. And often they might have a really good skill set in estate planning as well because the two do tend to go hand in hand. So you might find that you refer off to them. And there are a few businesses around who do actually provide specific services where you maintain the relationship but they'll provide the advice as, as a uh, a conduit from you. Uh, there's a group who's actually, uh, unfortunately they're only in Perth, they've just started up a few years ago, but they're called Professional Insurance Network or Professionals Insurance Network, PIN, and the way that they run it is that they'll actually provide all the, the advice, they're licensed, they'll structure the um, client's insurance needs and get them through the life of the underwriting process, but they share the income with whoever's referred the client, so the ownership of that client remains with you. Um, so you can look them up. They are in Perth only, but I do know that, that, that they handle a number of different states uh, from afar and I believe that their plan is that they'll put people on the ground in each different state. Um, Self-managed super funds, obviously, is absolutely an area of specialty. How do you find a good advisor in that? Look, I'd definitely be looking for SPA membership. I would be looking for their technical competence in terms of uh, the level of knowledge and depth that they have, that they do provide advice to clients if they are purchasing commercial property over and above just your typical managed funds sitting within a, a self-managed fund. Aged care is really important, uh, small to medium, small businesses, estate planning and of course investments. Um, the other way that you can check is advocacy. So do they have clients that are quite happy to give them testimonials? Great advisors will have video testimonials from their clients. Um, you can check them out on LinkedIn. If they don't have recommendations from clients on LinkedIn, sometimes they might have recommendations from peers only um, or perhaps service providers, someone from their licensee. I wouldn't negate that. that, that's great because they do tend to have a really close knowledge of the advisor's business. But I'd be looking for some referrals directly from clients as well. Aligned values. So uh, when you're getting to know the advisor that you're going to have a, a, a relationship with, you really want to make sure that you're on the same page in terms of what you think is important uh, for your clients uh, and in terms of general um, uh, personal values, I guess. And a great way to do that is to have coffee with them, just to have a chat to them about you know, how they see the world, how they see their business, what their objectives are for the future, what they think about the industry and the profession. Uh, they're all really important things to think about. Now, MC, I'm just getting a bit of a flag here. Are we okay with audio? Or have we dropped? It seems okay on this end. What I'll do, if, if you're having audio issues at the moment, guys, could you click? Actually, I'm hearing it again now, just as I speak. They're intermittent. Um, so it's happening at the GoToWebinar level. If you're having uh, audio issues at the moment, could you raise your hand? Click the raise hand button for us, guys. A couple are. Yeah. Um, I think we'll just soldier on because it's intermittent. Okay. It's, it's fine 98 percent of the time. Okay, all right, good. Um, so the other thing uh, is professionalism. Now what do I mean by professionalism? It's, it's, the term is bandied around a lot, I know. Um, but things like uh, are, do they have professional membership of a, an association? Your two biggest ones would be the Financial Planning Association and the AFA. Um, the FPA uh, does tend to have quite high um, uh, code of conduct and ethics and they are doing a, a much strong, a very strong push at the moment towards increased education levels and professionalism. Um, the AFA is also a great organisation as well. They're, they, they're probably not quite as far ahead in terms of the, the, the benchmark for ethics. Um, that's not to, sorry, that sounded awful. It's not to say that those members are not ethical, um, but it's a, it's a broader organisation. Um, how do they present? You know, would you be happy for the, the 
for this advisor to walk in front of your clients? How do they approach fees and the way that they charge for their services? Now, if you, great question, what's the AFA? That's the Association of Financial Advisors. So there's Financial Planning Association and Association of Financial Advisors. Uh, both of them are great organisations, but if they don't have an association with any, I'd, I'd possibly be querying that. Um, when it comes to fees, if you are governed by APES 230, now I know that when this came through, it was, I'm sure Mr Brown wouldn't like me to say watered down, but I know that it, the, the strength of it wasn't quite as, as what they had indicated initially. So um, if you're going to have an advisor that you work with that does charge asset-based fees and you are going to share in that remuneration, they do have those extra hurdles that are laid out in APES 230 to ensure that they have absolutely disclosed all of the things they want to disclose and that they have that, um, sorry, I just forget the term for a moment, expressed consent or, or yeah, something a little bit more detailed. We've yet to see that in practice, but I am led to believe that it is going to be a bit more than just a wishy-washy thing on a piece of paper. So you want to just talk through how they approach their fees. Uh, are they going to use flat fees or asset-based fees? How are they going to determine the fees? Now, I would suggest you might get uh, an indication of the level of fees that the advisor will provide. If I suggest to you, don't make any pre-assumption about whether or not that's expensive until you actually ask them to explain to you what those fees will cover. Because if you're providing financial advice to a client and investing their funds, there are a whole range of different um, areas that they might be charged fees in. The actual investment management, so perhaps the NERs if they're using managed funds, the admin fee if they're using a platform to invest, uh, and then of course the advisor fee on top of that. And just ask lots of questions about what those fees uh, in, uh, encompass before you start making a decision about whether they're expensive or not. Uh, so that, I guess that's got um, something to do with professionalism and also just their overall attitude to advice. Um, it could be a good indicator if they're complaining that the new rules have made life really difficult for them and they were, wish it was back in the good old days and FOFA was never around. Um, that might be a bit of a red flag for you. Uh, there are a lot of advisors that FOFA is not an issue for them whatsoever. They've already been running their business in accordance with, it, with a lot of the rules that have come down. A large majority would tend to say that they support the overarching um, theory behind FOFA, but there certainly are some uh, um, application issues in there that weren't really thought through. Um, so don't uh, don't make an assumption if they say, oh, FOFA wasn't as great as we all thought, that they're not professional. Talk to them in a little bit more detail. And absolutely use your intuition. I mean, really, uh, you know, I guess this is a little wishy-washy sort of thing, but if it barks like a dog and it looks like a dog, you really want to make sure that you're comfortable with the advisor before you start with them. So, the other options that we have, obtain a limited license. So, you could go direct to ASIC and get your limited license yourself. Uh, you could also use a compliance consultant to assist with that. Uh, they do tend to say that the limited license is supposedly not going to be that difficult to apply directly to ASIC, but with, um, I've yet to see the evidence of that. Uh, so um, the other option is that you get a limited license as an authorised rep through a licensee. Now, that's really in terms of you taking a limited license. You might find that you have a relationship with an external advisor that you're going to refer to that has a corporate authorised rep through the licensee, and it's possible that they may actually be able to sub-authorise you as a limited licensee. There are a few different options that you can talk to them about there. So if you already do have a trusted relationship, you know someone who would like to have that further with, have a chat with them, because you might find that their licensee they are already giving them the opportunity to be able to do that. But the sorts of things that you would think about in those two options are also similar to what you would do if you're going to get the full license. So I'm going to take a little bit more detail on that now. So, here are your options on getting your own full license, and a lot of these things would apply to getting the limited license as well. So if you're going to go straight to um, ASIC, you can pick up the kit, you can go through the process. Many people that I've spoken to who have done that found that it took an, uh, a, a very protracted length of time because they didn't quite have all of the information they needed, they had to keep going back and forth. 
So look, if I were to go out and, and uh, establish my own license today, I would probably use an external compliance provider to do it. Um, and the next couple of slides, I'm going to give you a few options of different service providers that we would recommend. Um, I've just, for simplicity's sake, I've grabbed three for each different component. That's not to say that there are not others out there that are equally competent or excellent at what they do as well. I'm just sharing with you, uh, particularly in this instance, ones that I know of personally, that we've either, I know them myself, or we've had clients that have had a great experience with them. So if you're wanting to apply for your own license and not only get the application through, but then also have a, an external provider give you ongoing compliance assistance, which is really important, there's three people on the screen there that I would absolutely recommend. AFSL Compliance, Stuart Chandler is based over here in actual fact he's in Margaret River in WA, but he has clients all around the country. Uh, and he's very good. He does travel a little, but he also does um, deal with a lot of electronic work. Uh, and I'm probably going to misquote this, but from memory, I think he only charges about $6,000 to get your new license through ASIC. Uh, these guys do this all the time. They've got all of the templates. They know exactly what's required by ASIC so that they'll help you, and that's probably the simplest way to do it. Catalyst Compliance, Steve and Miley, they're based in uh, Sydney, and again, I think they've got clients all around the country, and the Fold Legal are also very good. They're based in Sydney. They've also got an office up in Brisbane as well. So if you do have your own AFSL, you're going to seriously think about the ongoing management of that. And I've just dumped down a whole bunch of things that are very uh, uh, top of mind that you want to think about. You want to make sure that you have great compliance. And I would always suggest that you have an external provider that will assist you with this. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to have them come in and audit you every six months, but you do want to make sure that they are on your board of advice, that they know how you provide advice, that you can refer to them if you ever have a query about a particular client, and they are regularly checking your files and your advice that's going out. How are you going to manage your approved product list? So that is basically the investments that any of your advisors will um, recommend. Your education and training. Now, this is not only your initial education, but again, just like accounting, uh, you have CPD uh, requirements to fulfill, and how are you going to do that? Now, I put down the example of PD days and conferences. There are lots and lots of online solutions to maintain your CPD, but if you're doing um, conferences, PD days, it also gives you that level of camaraderie and the ability to be able to talk through different ideas with people and take them beyond just what's in a textbook. You have the remuneration management aspect. So uh, even if you're a purely a fee-based business and you're not taking any commissions, you will probably be electing where possible to have the platform provider or the administrator administer those funds for you so you don't have to set up invoices and chase debtors and all the rest of it. Um, so you need a really good software system to be able to manage that because you might have a whole range of different providers that are sending data feeds and income through and you need to be able to sort it and allocate it to clients. And there's some great software to do that. There's also great software to be able to provide as advice as well. So you want to be able to access that. So you could do all of that yourself and you could um, go to external providers to be able to give you all of that support. There are also uh, licensee service providers. So we used to call these dealer-to-dealer -dealer services. Effectively, these are typically, they actually stemmed from big licensee groups that found that they had advisors that got to a point where they wanted to go out and have their own license, but they still wanted to tap into their, um, their scale, I guess, to provide some of these things lifted, listed on the left-hand side of the screen. So the three I would suggest in that area that you could um, have a chat to, Pathway Licensee Services, uh, Associated Advisory Practices, or AAP, and VT Licensee Select also provide a really good um, dealer-to-dealer -dealer service. So again, that could mean that you have your own license, somebody else puts on conferences and PD days, they can use their buying power to access your advice software and so forth. Other option is obtain uh, your license through uh, an, uh, an organization. So you're basically an authorized rep, um, and the, you have a licensee that takes care of all of those things that were on the previous slide. What do you look for in a licensee? Look, something I would certainly recommend is, is, is a group that understands accounting practices. Because there are a lot of nuances within financial planners, within an accounting practice, that aren't evident in standalone planning practices. So I would certainly be recommending that you choose a group that's um, aware of those and can support you in that area. And I guess your big choice is, do I go with an institution 
uh, so an institutionally owned licensee, and I've given you three examples there. So Count Financial uh, is absolutely all about accountants. Uh, they're run by ex-accountants. They're you know a great bunch of people uh, and a very very good licensee. They are now owned by the Commonwealth Bank, though. So if you have an issue with that, then then you know you'd want to consider that. Uh, Securitor also has a great offering for accountant-based financial planners, and a lot of those uh, those guys through Securitor. Uh, um, exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, they're owned by Westpac and then you have Lonsdale who's also a group specifically designed for accountants and they are owned by IWF. There's a number of different uh, non-institutional licensees and again as I say I'm not listing all of the good ones, I've just picked three um, to share with you. So the Matrix group and these are groups that are independently owned, they're probably mid-sized licensees, they have somewhere between 100 to 150 odd financial planners. So you could be talking to Matrix Group, uh, In Focus Wealth Management, uh, Premium Wealth Management, they're probably a little bit smaller. Um, there's also a group called Century who's based in WA with uh, planners around the country. So there's a couple of different options that you can talk to. Um, I don't have a lot of time to, to drill into how do you pick the right licensee, uh, possibly something to talk about on another day, but look, I would overarchingly say make sure that you have aligned values with them and understand what they're going to provide for you for the dealer dealer fee that you will be paying them or the licensee fee that you will be paying them. Um, you get what you pay for uh, and often uh, you deal, I am still talking in my hands, thank you John, uh, often you will find that uh, um, uh, really simple, simply priced uh, licensees could be great for you if you're not going to be tapping into too many things that they're providing and there might be others that are really expensive um, but they're providing you too many bells and whistles that you don't really need. Uh, in answer to your question, John, who owns Lonsdale? It's IWF. So how do you make your own advice business work? Too many accounting practices are running financial planning businesses as a loss leader. Uh, it does not have to be the case. And I thought you might like this little quote there, MC. A loss leader is a marketing excuse masquerading as deliberate thought and strategy. I've had accountants say to me, we've not been able to um, really generate significant profits from the financial planning side, but we don't care about that because we just see it as a protection mechanism for our accounting side and we are generating great profits there. It can be the other way around. In fact, a number of the businesses that we're working with are generating higher profits from their financial planning business than they are their accounting, but there's a number of things that they've done to do that. So if we go back to, to our friends who I won't uh, disclose their name, how have they got to this point? I just want to share a couple of thoughts with you. So the first thing is they don't wear two hats. Initially when they started out, uh, the gentleman who provided the financial advice was actually an accountant and he started working as a planner. But he was still wearing both hats and he found that he kept being pulled back into the accounting side of the business. Once they found that he stepped down from accounting, they passed off his uh, tax clients to the other partners and he purely focused on financial advice, they straight away started to see an uplift. Not only because they could focus on, um, uh, on, on actually you know, concentrating on providing advice and marketing that advice, but if you think about the CPD you currently have as an accountant, doubling that to then uh, keep up to date with your knowledge on financial advice overall, uh, and then the actual changing conversations that you're having with clients, it is a lot to ask of yourself. So if you do have that ability, just have someone that focuses purely on advice. Second thing is, if you have advisors in your practice, get them into your staff training sessions. Now, there's a number of different ways to do this. It might be that they're going to come and share uh, a technical strategy that they've, uh, that they've used with a client or perhaps that they've learned that, you know, we know legislation changes almost daily, uh, so it might be something that I've covered in, in some of the training that they've been doing. So giving your people some ideas about the different types of strategies that could apply for, for their clients. Not so that they're educating them so they can start recommending them, but so that they can be aware that they exist, which then means that they can start seeing the potential opportunities to refer people over. Another great example that we've seen strike great dividends is having boardroom lunches where the accountants bring a client file, they open it up as a team, they talk in general about this is what's going on in this client's life and the advisor then gives some suggestions on the type of advice that they might provide them and how they can help them get a better outcome. And what that does is it then enables the accountants to 
perhaps increase that professional respect that they have for the advisor because they can see that they are very talented and very good and understand the difference that financial advice can make to people. And then the third option is they absolutely collaborate. So whenever they do have a client that they recommend over to the financial planner, they're very uh, clear on the advice that they're providing. The planner goes to the accountant to at least extract some information that they have on file about the client, but they do still do a full get to know you or, or fact find or whatever you like to call it, to, so the planner can really understand the client's motivations. You can often, often pick up uh, an amount of financial information through BGL or whatever software you're using, but to really understand the client's needs and wants is imperative to create their plan. And of course, the last thing they do is they, they also have us, so we do coach them. Um, now, I'm not doing this as a, as a completely blatant plug, but I just wanted to show you before we wrap up for some questions. What I've got on screen there is what we call our business success wheel. So whenever we work with a new business, we'll go in and unpack and really understand how they're running their planning practice at the moment. And what you see around in the blue little tags there, there's 18 different components of an advice business that will impact on the, the success or otherwise. And we use this wheel, the analogy is um, uh, if you have a straight spoke, you're going well. If it's a wobbly spoke, you really need some work in that area. And if it's a missing spoke, it's putting your business at risk. You need to focus on it. So most businesses look a little bit more like this you'll see they've got some wobbly spokes. These guys are in particular pure genius financial planning. It's not a real name, it's our mock name. Uh, they really just weren't making the money that they were looking for out of it. So I don't have much time yet at, at this point now to pull out any of those spokes to talk in more detail, but I think we are going to be doing some more future webinars with MC, so keep an eye out for those and I'll start drilling into some more of those areas. We might open up to questions now from the floor, um, and indeed if you want me to go into any of those, I, I most certainly can do. Um, and in fact, before I do that, I'll just mention we do actually run a, a, a blog and we have a regular article series, so we do talk about various different issues that make a difference to financial planning businesses. I had a chat to MC, usually when we do these sessions everyone wants to subscribe, so rather than having to go off and do that, um, we're happy to subscribe to you all to that service um, after the session. If anybody doesn't want to be subscribed to that, not a problem at all, just let us know. And of course if you don't like it, you can unsubscribe at any time. But let's open it up to questions. Are you there MC? Have you got some uh, questions on the list there that we want to talk through? Now, a topic that you touched on towards the end there, Karen when she registered, she asked, how do you convince accountants this is in their best interest of their clients when, um, in Karen's words here, telling them over and over doesn't work? So you touched on that just before. Maybe drill deeper into, because accountants quite often and quite understandably are very protective of the tr strong trust they have with their clients. So what's some more tips around getting the accountants on board to really see that it is in their client's best interest to refer yeah. across and get the planners involved? That's a great question. And look, it, it's, it's not uncommon. We do often see that there's not a great deal of professional respect from accountants if they haven't been working with a planner um, for, or haven't been working with a great planner. Um, so the first thing is, is absolutely demonstrate what great financial advice means to clients. Because you're right, accountants do tend to be fairly protective. Uh, and unless they've actually seen the evidence, unless they've seen the outcomes of a client having a great financial plan, they just don't get it. And I don't mean that in an offensive way, but, but how would you? So as an advisor, I, I would be, either as an accountant, ask the advisor to prove it to you. But if you're an advisor wanting to help the accountants on that journey, I would be sharing some case studies with, with them. Um, if they're not actual clients of the accountant, take some of the actual clients of your own and talk through the different things that your advice did for them. Um, it might be some client stories that you get on video. It might be uh, purely technical related, sort of talking about what they started with and then what was important to them and what your advice did and what the outcomes were. Um, that can help them from a, in, an intellectual level and then I think the first time you get a referral is really talk them through to understand here's an exact client that you have, this is what we've done for them and then the accountant's going to be able to talk to the uh, uh, client as well and just see the difference that it's made in their lives. I mean honestly, if you have not seen the result of someone getting great financial advice, mm. um, you will be blown away once you do see it. I mean that's, that, I guess that's why I'm so passionate about what I do in helping advisors do this because Great advisors really make a massive difference in people's lives. And if you're not 
providing that referral to your clients. You're, you're potentially doing them a disservice. So you mentioned their case studies and examples that are success stories. What about um, anti-stories in terms of horror stories from situations where there's been a lack of advice? Are they um, worthwhile sharing if, if you know, you've got actual examples to share with the team? Oh, most definitely. Um, and, and some are examples where people have been with a previous advisor and then found the new advisor. The most obvious, you know, I can share one with you personally. I have a, a very close girlfriend right now who's moved back from London. Um, she's a single mum with an eight-year-old. She's just been diagnosed with breast cancer and she has no cover whatsoever. So here's a woman running her own business. She's pretty much superwoman as it is, running her own business, has a young child who's five and a half. Uh, now she's been struck down with cancer. So she's going to have to go through all treatment, everything on public health. And to give you an idea of what's that like, what that's like, she had the lumpectomy two weeks ago. They sent her home from hospital still catheterised. Now, if you have a client that has great cover, that would never happen to them. And they would concentrate on getting better without having to worry about the financial aspects as well. Mm. So that's where someone hasn't had access to really good advice. Um, and I, I'm sure if you talk to any financial advisor, they would be able to give you lots of different stories as well. One thing, if I could build on that, Sue, um, that we've seen, even though our focus is on modern marketing, social media blogging, etc., what we're good at is helping firms bring about change, change in behaviour. And there's three um, things that you need to get in place for behaviours to change, and it's mindset, skills, and systems. And the mindset side of things, if the accountants don't totally emotionally buy in from their belief system and their personal values, that it is in their best interest, well, you know, forget any piece of software or any technique or any script or any process, it's not going to happen, is it? So I think mm. probably stories are one of the best ways to, to really illustrate what we call the, the moral obligation, that advisors, whether we're talking accountants, financial planners and other related financial advisory, that moral obligation, you spot something, you owe it to your clients to, to raise it with them. A quick example that I witnessed is a fellow parent at our children's school, uh, my wife just happened to mention that uh, they were really struggling because they had no income. One income family, tradesperson in his own business, fell off a ladder, injured, couldn't work. I said, well, who's their accountant? And uh, the question was why? And I said, well, if they've lodged their tax, the accountant would have not noticed whether or not they had income protection or not, and they didn't. So that's the difference between having advisors on board who totally buy in to the moral obligation of we owe it to our clients to advise. We're not human checklists, we're not vending machines, we're actually here to notice things, to diagnose and to act on those. But, um, you know, that's pretty much do not pass go, do not collect $200 unless everyone's on board. Yeah. There. Risk examples are, are really visible and, and they're, they're often when people have had a catastrophe in their life, so they're quite emotional. But even for non-risk, you know, if it's about investing, if it's about helping people save and get enough money, they're not immediately, um, uh, they're not immediately apparent. I mean, often it takes you know, 10 years before you see the true value of an advice business. But I tell you, when you have a client who's got a great financial advisor and they have a great relationship, even though they may not have seen the tangible outcome of taking that advice, their sense of support, accountability, their, their relaxation and sleep at night factor are, are, are palpable. Now, no. I, do, I have noticed actually that there's a great question that's come through. What's an easy way for a new startup accountant to get aligned with a dealer group? Currently, you're a one-man operation. Um, I would start making a few phone calls. Um, you might find that it's potentially the larger licensees who will be happier to take you on because they can subsidise you with some of their um, their bigger practices. So typically, I know it's going to sound awful, but purely from a financial perspective, you're not going to be worth a great deal to them initially until you build up your business. But I do know that there's some of the larger organisations that are creating um, good offers for startup businesses it might not be that they give you a, a PDM or, a, or a, someone to work with you one-to-one, -one, but they've got some great ways that you can develop um, uh, sort of support um, in, in one-to-many situations. So I just get on the phone and start talking to people and then compare the offers that you're getting. Okay, brilliant. Well, um, the other thing that I was going to raise just before a couple of points to close off and keep us close to time, that question about choosing a licensee, because there's a, a lot of detail and you have a depth of knowledge there, Sue, and so do your coaches, that's an ideal question, I think, to continue on the LinkedIn group. 
later this Absolutely. afternoon or in coming days. Yeah. So, so a reminder to everyone, I sent the link through earlier in the chat window, so you can just click on that hyperlink now. You can click on that now because it will disappear when we close the webinar in a moment. So bit.ly forward slash Paradox Live will go to the LinkedIn group. Click the Join button, and then once you're approved there, uh, you can ask Sue whatever questions you like, or indeed ask Paradox any questions about any aspect of your modern marketing. Um, so just in closing, um, I'd like to thank you, Sue, for the preparation and uh, the presentation today. I really appreciate it, and I, I think um, everyone gets a sense that there's so much more detail you could have gone to in any of those individual slides. So thank you for your time today. Pleasure. And I would like everyone, uh, when the webinar closes in just a moment, to please complete the survey that will appear on your screen. There's four questions. Let us know what you thought about today's webinar. Tick uh, yes, yes please, no thanks to whether you want any more information from Sue and Elixir Consulting or from Paradox on the marketing side. And lastly, any questions or any feedback, any suggestions for future topics you'd like to see in these webinars. So thank you for joining us today. We had a massive turnout to today's webinar and the next couple of webinars, in about a month's time we'll be running another webinar but it'll be a panel discussion around this area of the relationship between accountants and financial planners. We'll have Sue back again and also uh, a very well-known author and authority in this space, Scott Charlton. So that'll be a panel discussion. But in eight days' time, on a marketing-related topic, I'll be doing an interview, a half-hour interview with a financial planning firm that has uh, achieved wonderful things with their use of social media, blogging, and the modern marketing approaches. So that'll be an interview with Drew Grosskrich of the Otium Group, which is a Sunshine Coast firm specializing in financial planning. So you'll find out how they've uh, increased their web traffic by 22 times, they've increased their revenue by over 2.5 times in terms of what they're tracking per month, okay. and the period of time from when someone inquires to when the engagement is completed has come down by two-thirds, so that will be an interesting chat to say the least. So thanks again right. Sue, and thanks everyone for joining us, look forward to seeing you in the LinkedIn group, and for our next webinar, bye for now. Fantastic, see you there, bye. Bye.